Hi, I'm Joel Kearns. I'm the uh, Vice President for Solar R&D at MEMC Electronic Materials in St. Peter's, Missouri. From 2006 to uh, 2010, I was a transition manager at NASA headquarters, planning the uh, phase out shutdown of the space shuttle program and the transition to the Constellation program. Uh, before that, early in my career at NASA in the 1980s and 90s, I worked at NASA headquarters in the Office of Space Science and Applications. I worked at Marshall Space Flight Center as the manager of the Microgravity Research Program. I worked immediately before becoming transition manager as the director of project manager, management and engineering at the Ames Research Center at Moffett Field, California. And then in 2006, I came to the Space Operations Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters to work transition of the space shuttle. Uh, from that, about that time, I worked with John Olson, who was the transition manager in the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. And together, we planned the fly out and phase out of the space shuttle and the transition uh, to the Constellation program. We did all the planning from about 2006, 2007, 2009, which led to the successful uh, completion of the space shuttle program, its uh, phase out and retirement and the transfer of equipment, peoples, and facilities that were needed to NASA's follow-on human spaceflight programs. Planning for the retirement of the space shuttle and the follow-on to the next generation of human spaceflight vehicles had started around the time of President Bush's direction for the vision of space exploration in early 2004. Uh, Lisa Rowe and other senior executives at NASA had led an activity in the space shuttle program to identify all the people, equipment, property, information, software, everything that would be phased out and probably dispositioned at the end of the space shuttle program in 2010, part of which would be transferred to the follow-on program called Constellation when shuttle's mission was completed. The initial planning was done in 2004 and 2005. I joined the effort in 2006, late in 2006, sometime after Robert Lightfoot had um, been conducting the planning at NASA headquarters following Lisa Rowe, and Mike Hawes, who was then the, associate the Deputy Associate Administrator for Program Integrations and Space Operation Mission Directorate, had further planned out the shuttle retirement and transition to, the to uh, Constellation. Uh, with a guiding document called the uh, Human Spaceflight Transition Plan. Um, a large amount of personal property, contracts, software, computers, and real properties such as buildings have been identified to either be phased out or dispositioned or transferred to Constellation by 2005, 2006, but a lot of the detail planning had not yet been done. Uh, John Olson and I, working with the Space Shuttle Program in Houston, the Space Station Program at Houston, and the Constellation program at that same location then undertook very detailed planning to identify exactly what equipment or software or other items would be needed by Constellation at the conclusion of the space shuttle program, or what items or facilities or people might even be needed earlier by Constellation than the completion of the space shuttle program. We conducted um, uh, several iterations of planning as part of the NASA standard budget cycle, which is the program planning, budgeting, and execution process. We did this every year from 2006 to about 2009, putting in greater and greater levels of detail and framing decisions that senior executives could make on the disposition of all these activities going from Space Shuttle uh, to Constellation. Well, when I joined the effort in 2006, a lot of the strategy and the framework was in place. But the details that would really let someone understand how to plan the work in detail so it could be properly executed three to four years from now was still not in place. So after building relationships with the participants who would actually be planning and executing the work in the future, we built um, standard project management tools. We built work breakdown structures. We built master schedules. Uh, we uh, put together a series of decision packages for the senior executives to make decisions on at that point, the decision packages were really related to how to plan all the phase out and the close out and the transfer activities, uh, as opposed to specific decisions to make on which, which items would go to what location, which would take place um, years later. What I found at that time is that um, we had to maintain a focus on successfully flying out the space shuttle and successfully ramping up the Constellation program, and at the same time put in the effort for the detailed plan that, that was needed
so that one or two years down the road, people could make the correct decisions and execute in a very short period of time all the shutdown, the transfer activities that would be needed. If we hadn't put that level of detail in place in 2007 and 2008, by the time we got to the end of the space shuttle program in 2009 or 2010, there would have been an extremely large amount of work to be done that would have taken many additional years and cost extra money uh, that wouldn't have to have been expended if we had done the detailed planning in those earlier years. But we soon found that we needed to bring in other participants at NASA besides simply the mission directorates uh, who controlled the human spaceflight programs. We reached out to Olga Dominguez, who was Assistant Administrator for Infrastructure, and after a series of discussions, she named Rich Wickman as the transition manager representing the institutional side of NASA. We had many discussions with the Assistant Administrator for Procurement to understand how the contracts needed to be modified or changed to close out the space station, close out the space shuttle, transfer items to the space station, or transfer contractors from space shuttle to the Constellation program. We spent a great deal of time working with human capital resources management at NASA headquarters and its field installations to understand how we would either retain or transfer civil servant workers from one program to another and what the impacts would be on the industrial partners as space shuttle uh, came to a close and its contracts phased out, but Constellation took over work in different areas. So over a period of time from 2007 to 2009, the planning and the execution of the transition from Space Shuttle to Constellation branched out from an initially small group that was focused on human spaceflight to make it almost NASA-wide. And by 2009, the human spaceflight transition plan that had been uh, put together by Mike Cause with Bill Gerstenmaier and Scott Horowitz had expanded its scope to the point where it was officially called the NASA Transition Plan when it was implemented because it affected so many organizations. Requirements were uh, well understood at a top level in 2006 and 2007. What I mean by requirement are the things that you have to do, the scope that you have to satisfy to do the work. In this case, the transition of the Space Shuttle to Constellation or the phase out of the items that wouldn't be needed by Space Shuttle or Constellation. But we found as we planned the work in greater and greater levels of detail that there were many things that different people interpreted as being requirements or how to implement a requirement which were different from person to person or work group from work group. And of course, understanding exactly what the requirement is, what needs to be done, tells you not only in many ways what needs to be done, but how you have to do it to satisfy that you've completed it successfully. One of the things I was surprised at was that it took so much iteration and discussion with different groups to understand what really needed to be done to get to the point to understand how much of it you needed to do to satisfactorily complete it. One example of that is what to do about items, for example, that had flown in space which could be considered historical artifacts of the United States. There is a NASA standard that talks about what to do with historical artifacts. In general, they go to museums instead of being uh, used in other areas or disposed of. But it turned out that identifying exactly what the criteria was to say whether something were, was an artifact or not was quite subjective. It really went back to subject matter experts. The way the NASA policy was written, an expert group would get together to look at a thing and decide whether it was an artifact. When the space, at the end of the space shuttle program, we had on the order of 20,000 items for people to look at. It would have taken years and years for an expert group to look at all these different items and make an individual determination. So in working with Rich Wickman, we had to lay out criteria where large groups of people distributed at different centers in a short period of time could take a look at all the items or the pieces of personal property that would come out of the space shuttle, which weren't needed by Constellation and Station, and make a fast determination on whether they made the, met the criteria of historical artifact or not. Then if something was an artifact, we had to figure out how much effort to put into its preservation and finding a new home for it. Again, in that area, Rich Wickman and the institutional people outside the space flight programs played a key role in working with the General Services Administration in the U.S. government to set up a process so that once artifacts were understood, or even once any other property was understood that wasn't an artifact, that it was very clear how to disposition it and get it to its, where its eventual home should be right at the completion of the space shuttle program. A key lesson from looking at requirements was to try to First, un try to understand as quickly as you can what the real requirement is. And sometimes it takes iteration and discussion with groups to really make sure everyone agrees on what the requirement is.
Then you have to look at how do you really satisfy the requirement. Something we did through several iterations over several years in planning the retirement of the space shuttle was to figure out if we needed to do a thing, how much of it did we really need to do? Where did we get the guidance and who was the decision authority of how much of it needed to be done? In a great, in, to a great extent of the space shuttle uh, program phase that in particular when we dispositioned a large number of items of personal property, how much it would cost and how long it would take for a large number of items really depended on how much you had to do on every single individual item. So we had to reach agreement in the requirements of not only the what and the how. We found also by iterating it that in some cases how much of it you did really depended on what the benefit was, the cost-benefit trade of how much effort you put in. And we found that we had to iterate that with all the stakeholders inside and in some cases outside NASA to arrive at the total plan based on those requirements that everyone would agree to go execute when the space shuttle had successfully completed its missions in 2010 and 2011. So it's important to remember that some of the most important things about the transition and eventual retirement of the space shuttle was that it really wasn't just a retirement exercise. The main points was that we had to successfully fly at the space shuttle manifest, which at that point were still tens of missions to fly. We had to successfully assemble the space station so it could be used for research operations in the 2010 decade that we're in now. And we had to successfully ramp up and bring up to speed the Constellation program of vehicle development. So many of the things that we did to disposition things related to space shuttle and transfer to Constellation were based on trying to be very efficient in satisfying those three goals, plus planning the retirement and executing the retirement and phase out of the space shuttle. For example, um, in 2004, when President Bush worked with NASA to formulate the vision for space exploration, the decisions that were codified in the federal budget at that time in 2004 was that the space shuttle would complete all its missions in 2010, and at that point, the human spaceflight programs would be the space station program and the constellation program. The way the federal budget was constructed by Steve Isakowitz and Sean Keith was to, Sean O'Keefe was the plan that they would fund the space shuttle through its mission completion. And then after that point, the, all the money that had previous in years been budgeted to operate the space shuttle would be used to fund activities to, ve to develop vehicles for the constellation program. What that meant is that there were any space shuttle transition or retirement activities that took place after the last year of flying the space shuttle. In that year's NASA budget in 2004, they weren't budgeted at all in any of the years that the activities would have to take place. Now, there was an understanding that once NASA developed a budget to phase out the space shuttle and to transfer things to Constellation, that if those activities occurred before the year 2010, they would be covered under the space shuttle program budget. But if they took place after 2010, they would have to be, the, mon the money that was needed would have to be reprogrammed out of the Constellation budget into some type of transition project budget. Now, if NASA were to transfer too much money out of the Constellation budget early for the years, say, 2011, 2012, or 2013, it would leave less money in those years for Constellation to plan its work, and it would stretch out its schedule. If we budgeted no money, then once we got to the year 2011, we would have to go back in and disrupt everyone to get some resources in order to do the activities we needed to do to phase out the space shuttle and transition to Constellation those years. For example, we would have to expend money to safe the orbiters before they could go to museums. We would have to spend money to decommission buildings and demolition them if they were no longer needed. So there would definitely be some money that would have to be spent. Now this, uh, so in the beginning when we planned out the, all the activities that needed to be done for space shuttle transition and retirement, for the first couple of years while the shuttle was flying, we could allocate money that had normally been going to the space shuttle program to do the planning, get ready to do all the retirement and transfer activities. But to actually do those transfer activities or to actually disposition those things in 11, 12, and 13, NASA would have to take an action to reprogram money and take it away from exploration systems and put it into this TNR activity. So we spent a great deal of time trying to really understand the requirements and figure out how much money was really needed. Our philosophy was every dollar we took to retire the space shuttle after 2010 was a dollar that was not going to go to exploration systems and NASA's follow-on vehicles. It was going to be time that was going to be delayed until American astronauts could get back into space or we would have our own access to the space station on American vehicles. What that drove us to do was examine the work we had to do in 2011 and beyond very critically 
it, it, it made us um, try to understand what did we really have to do as opposed to what was simply nice to do that maybe someone could afford, couldn't afford if they didn't have the funds available. It made us do many, many exercises iteratively to refine the work breakdown structure, to refine the requirements, refine the schedules, try to group things, activities together into the most efficient way we could to execute them in 2011 and beyond. And finally, in about the year um, 2009 or 2010, we brought forward to the administrator of NASA the reprogramming decision package that would move some money from Constellation, from Constellation to the Space Shuttle to conduct the TNR retirement of the Space Shuttle. It, it took a lot of discussion and debate so that we all understood at that time when we moved money uh, post-10 from Constellation to the Space Shuttle, how would it affect Constellation? Do we really have to move that money? But because of all the work that had been done in requirements planning and task planning and all the coordination that had been done in 2007, 8, and 9, the conclusions were pretty well accepted at the point that we made the recommendation. When um, Lisa Rowe had started planning what type of work might be needed to be done at the conclusion of the space shuttle uh, to retire all its assets and transfer them to Constellation, people at NASA gave the best estimates they could, but they were necessarily kind of conservative, which means they were somewhat overstated. People didn't want to ask for too little and then come back years later and disrupt Constellation by having to ask for more money. But as we spent more and more time planning and more and more time understanding the requirements and defining the tasks, we found out that we could group the work more efficiently. And in effect, we needed less money in 2011 and beyond, to the point where when we did the reprogramming, it wasn't a big disruption to Constellation uh, to transfer the money over in 2011, 2012, and 2013. Now, I was a project manager and a program manager at NASA. And I can tell you from a uh, personal viewpoint at the time, was I was spending a lot of effort with a good, hardworking group of people planning work that we did not have money to go execute in 2011 and beyond, almost no matter how much it was, but we knew it needed to be done. So it did make me uneasy. I remember thinking at the time that, boy, I wish I had a budget and then I'd know how much to plan to, and at least I could measure whether I thought I could get my work done on time. But a lesson I took out of this later was that we actually did it the right way. In, in other words, waiting to refine the requirements was the right thing to do. I remember John Olson and I, uh, every few months, would talk to Bill Gerstenmeier and Scott Horowitz and some of the other stakeholders about what we thought the tasks were and what the resources were going to be that were needed. But if you take a look at the amount of money and the amount of time it turned out we actually needed to do transition and requirement, at the point we had finished uh, putting the plan together and refining it with people in, say, 2008, 2009, it was really a fraction of the cost and time that people had originally thought it would be in 2004 and 2005. All that extra planning and scrutiny and the effort people had put in to really understand what had been done had really brought down the cost and the time that was needed. So by the time we actually made the decision to put the resources in place, we didn't overburden the follow-on program with Constellation. So you have to think about the lesson out of this. As a project manager, I was trained to believe that going in the door, we needed to have a set of requirements, a schedule, and a budget. And in this particular case, where it turned out we didn't have a firm understanding of the requirements in the beginning, it was actually better to wait. And it was very straightforward to have the necessary resources available at the point we did have a firm understanding of the requirements several years after I started. Now, risk management was interesting. Um, it was an interesting activity during the transition and retirement of the space shuttle to Constellation. All of NASA's major human spaceflight programs conduct a rigorous risk management. Shuttle had risk management. Constellation did as part of its startup and put into its project. Space Station did. But what I, we found interesting um, was that some one program's risk might be another program's um, mitigation to its own risk. And in planning something that crossed over so many programs and eventually into the institution of NASA, we found that we had to have the programs and the institution communicate what they thought their risks were and how it was they were controlling and managing their risks. At the, at the uh, program level at the Johnson Space Center, we encouraged the Space Shuttle, Space Station, and Constellation program to exchange information, including how they manage their risk at what was called a, pro a tri-program joint program requirements board, where the program managers would get together with their agents to exchange information and make any decisions they could make at their level that didn't have to come to NASA headquarters. For John Olson and I, who acted as agents for the two associate administrators, Bill Gerstenmeier and Scott Horowitz, we had Dave Langle and his uh, group 
conduct a series of transition uh, risk uh, technical interchange meetings, which included the programs, the headquarters offices, including the headquarters support offices, such as procurement and infrastructure and administration, human capital, to try to bound and periodically assess all the risks across all those entities. Some of those offices were not really used to doing a rigorous risk management a quarter to quarter, a month to month. Others, like the Space Shuttle, the Constellation program, did that daily. We found through integrating the risks in that manner that we could get a feel for how things were going across all these different information, all these different organizations and all these different programs, and we can make that information available to Scott Horowitz, uh, Bill Gerstenmaier, and other stakeholders and managers that were involved in the transition effort, as well as the center directors at JSC, Marshall, Kennedy, Stennis, and other affected centers. Now, what I found in doing this is I thought that they were very worthwhile because one of the things we had to do for all different activities and transitions, we had to get people to talk frequently and communicate so that they would all have the same information. Now, I found out that Scott Horowitz and Bill Gerstenmaier, probably because of their daily interaction with the human spaceflight programs, were really well aware of the risks. They had a really good feel for relative risks and what was a risk for one organization and potentially an opportunity for a different organization. But we found it was always better to err on the side of transferring information, and we found having these periodic uh, transition risk quarterlies brought everyone together into one forum where everyone would hear what everyone else said at one time, and it could clear up quite a bit of misunderstandings uh, week for week, month to month, or quarter to quarter. Early in the planning process for what activities would be conducted as part of the transition requirement, senior managers asked what metrics would be made available and what were meaningful metrics that would be generated so that people could track the progress originally in the planning and later the execution to transition the retirement. So metrics were generated relatively early in planning the transition back uh, probably in 2007, the first year I was there. Between SOMD and ESMD at headquarters and Constellation and Space uh, Station, uh, Space Shuttle programs in Houston, we put together a series of metrics to talk about not only what things would be transferred from Space Shuttle to Constellation, but what things would be retired and phased out at the completion of Space Shuttle program. We, we found that one of the difficult things in framing together metrics was that it was very straightforward to, event, to reach agreement within a short period of time of what it is you would like to measure, but sometimes it was very difficult in systems to actually gather the data to have you make a meaningful measurement. It would be really easy to make metrics based on what it was that there was easy data available for as opposed to meaningful things that you wanted to measure. And we found it took maybe a year to 18 months to pull together the really useful data that was a useful metric. And I'll give an example of that. Um, one of the biggest uh, concerns we had about eventual cost of the retirement of the space shuttle was that we were going to have to disposition tens and tens of thousands of people, pieces of personal property at the conclusion of the space shuttle program. That is, property which could be personal computers, um, sheets of metal, sheets of ceramic, um, everything that really wasn't a building, it wasn't software, if Constellation didn't need it after 2010. So there was a cost associated with each of those dispositions. So it was very important to understand how many items were there of what type, because different types of items might need some type of different work to be done on them before they can be dispositioned. So we set up metrics to take a look at how much property did we have in the space shuttle program, say in 2007, 2008, so that we could think about how much of it wouldn't be used by Constellation by 2011, and then how fast and what rate would we disposition it and access it, say from 2011 to 2013. We found out after we set up the metrics that depending on the definition of what needed to be measured, it may sound very basic, but what is a piece of property? Is it one individual thing or is it a group of things? Is it one thing by itself in a corner or is it everything of one type that's already bound up in a pallet or a stock room location? Depending on what the definition was, you got a very, very different answer of how much of it you needed to do something with and what it would take to eventually move it out of NASA at the conclusion of the space shuttle program. So that was a metric we set up very early and we found out probably about two years into planning the space shuttle activity that the metric we had framed, we had not quite defined the way that would make it the most meaningful. And more than that, we found out that the data we were getting to understand how we were doing against the metrics wasn't exactly the same as the definition we were doing. So we had to go back and reframe the metrics. We had to spend 
more effort to make sure that the data we got on the actual state was really matching the definition that we had. And that took additional time and cost a little bit more money than we thought it would in the beginning. And this is a, 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 um, a lesson, again, in understanding what your requirements really are and reaching agreement of what it is you really want to measure to help you make decisions. And do you really have the data available that matches that metric so you can really measure it or not? Or do you have to find a way to construct that data if it's really important? You know, for example, we were very concerned, and it turned out we were right, that the number of pieces of personal property to disposition at the end of the space shuttle program would be a major cost driver to carrying out the transition and the retirement. But we didn't realize in the beginning that it wasn't easy really to measure exactly how much of it there was. We found out later that it was well worth having these metrics in place because once they were put in place and once we found out how to improve them so that in the last two years of planning the transition and requirement, they were really good metrics, we could use them to gauge how much work had been done prior to the last year of the space shuttle operations and how much work needed to be done after the last year of space oper shuttle operations. And as I've said, the, the resources we needed after the last year of space operations, space shuttle operations, had to be reprogrammed out of the Constellation program and made, made available. So we really had to track how much work did we have in total to do, how much needed to be done before the last space shuttle flight, and how much was remaining to be done after the last space shuttle flight. And we found that only by having metrics that were um, the right metrics that you could easily get the data from to know whether you were meeting them or not, and that were based on sound definitions of um, the work, the high value work you really had to do, did you understand whether you're making adequate progress from 2006 all the way out to 2013, year on year, quarter on quarter? Early in the planning for the uh, retirement of the space shuttle, a lesson learned that was taken from other major government programs like the Titan rocket program phase out was that to try to understand all the work that needed to be done for the transition retirement action, that all the current activities in the program, whether it was the space segment or the ground segment, should be divided up into what were called capabilities. And the Space Shuttle Program did this with NASA headquarters, uh, referring to this assessment as the Strategic Capabilities Assessment. A capability, for example, could be how to make and fly and operate turbo pumps, which are a component of the Space Shuttle main engine. Now, if you don't have a turbo pump or you don't know how many turbo pumps you need to dispose of or give to someone at the end of the program, um, you wouldn't be able to plan the work that needed to be done in retirement. But a capability is more than just a, a piece of item, the way uh, an item, say, or a building. The way it was described uh, from the programs that were benchmarked that we used to, to build this idea of strategic capabilities was it was all the things you needed to have a function. If a capability was a function, like having a turbo pump, you needed people, you needed manufacturing facilities, you needed instructions and software, all those things that let you make, manufacture, use, and eventually disposition a turbo pump. Uh, several hundred capabilities were uh, described for the space shuttle program. It was eventually narrowed to about 100 strategic capabilities. But it turned out by looking at these um, other benchmark programs um, and using their framework to plan the retirement of the space shuttle, it wasn't quite that intuitive. If you think of the space shuttle or any other aerospace vehicle, there's a space vehicle, there's a ground segment. You, it's pretty well known what the elements of the space vehicle are. For example, in the space shuttle, there was a space shuttle orbiter, tank, um, external tank, solid rocket boosters, solid rocket motors, space shuttle main engines. And you could go down almost in a work breakdown structure to break those into smaller and smaller pieces, again, from a piece of hardware. That is a little bit different division of responsibilities and activities than a strategic capability is. And when you consider that Many of these end items uh, were, pr were provided by single contracts. For example, there was one contractor that did all the space shuttle main engines, and they did the turbo pumps as well as every other piece of the space shuttle main engine. Sometimes it was really hard to divide up their work into these different strategic capabilities. I personally thought that while the strategic capabilities were a good way to initially frame the space shuttle transition activities, that is, what decisions need to be made, what items need to be disposed of, that focusing too much too early in the strategic capabilities took time away from planning a much more detailed set of tasks, which is what we did eventually, putting together a very detailed work breakdown structure for the transition and retirement of the space shuttle. This is just a personal um, belief, but I felt that if we had gone directly into planning a work breakdown structure based on the major elements of the flight and ground segment of the shuttle and how those would either be dispositioned or sent to Constellation or Space Station, 
that we might have been able to get sooner to a better definition of the work, a better definition of the requirements and the costs that were actually needed for the transition and the requirement. So I think NASA did the right thing in trying to benchmark other successful activities that had undergone a transition or requirement, retirement. But in this specific case, focusing everyone exclusively on strategic capabilities for the first two years probably took effort away from the activities that came later and delayed them that really let us plan the details of transition and requirement that NASA really used to execute transition and requirement after the completion of the space shuttle program in 2011. Well, when President uh, Bush announced that in 2004 that NASA would complete the flyout of the space shuttle to finish assembling the space station, and then we, and then NASA would have a new human spaceflight activity uh, called Constellation to support that vision, it was envisioned early that space shuttle would take through about 2010 to finish constructing the space station and would stop flying. The initial NASA plan to start flying at least the prototypes of the equipment that would be Constellation, what back then was called the Crew Exploration Vehicle was to have a first flight in 2008. So in other words, the crew exploration vehicle would be flying before the last space shuttle flight. I don't think it was envisioned that the crew exploration vehicle would be in routine space flight operations by about 2010, but at least the first test flights would have taken place. As Congress uh, dispositioned the president's budget year after year, uh, the date shifted. Uh, the space shuttle program, we still had to finish pretty well as soon as we could by 2010 uh, to again finish assembling the space station on time so it could be used and also to free up resources for the follow-on program. But because early budgets were never really provided at the president's request, um, the, and as Constellation Plan became more and more detailed, the first flight dates for the CEV and eventually the, the later defined Ares rockets and follow-on elements like the lunar lander shifted to the right in time. They had to. You had to do a certain amount of uh, work, and it could only fit within the budgets that Congress uh, would um, put into law and the president would propose year on year. So within a few years after the president's uh, vision statement, the first flight for the CEV was no longer in 2008. I think it was probably in uh, 2012 or so. Now, Mike Griffin, uh, I know the, the NASA administrator at the time, said several times in transition meetings that he really wanted to have the first flight of the CEV right around the time at the end of the first, the last flight of the space shuttle so that there was no gap in what we call American um, human spaceflight launch capability. Now, if I had total control of the resources and the spacecraft during the, the time of the end of the space shuttle and the transition to the follow-on spacecraft, I probably would have taken a one to two year gap to retrain everyone, get ready to go, and launch the next uh, human space launch vehicle about two years after the end of the space shuttle program. I, I could understand the point of the people that thought you needed to have some breather space to get everyone's heads um, on the next game, in effect, after successfully finishing all the work of the space shuttle. My personal opinion is that, um, that NASA roughly gets a known amount of money every year. It, roughly, we get the, NASA gets the same amount of money every year, plus or minus some. And that if you saw how much money would be made available when the space shuttle program was finished, you could probably have an idea if NASA had a level budget, how much money you had to construct spacecraft um, following the end of the space shuttle program. So I think it was possible if, if uh, the president and the Congress had that mindset together with NASA that the follow-on vehicle could have been um, scoped in size perhaps to fit within the budget that was available even today. But bear in mind, it would have been a very different vehicle. The Orion vehicle we have today is scoped to be our future vehicle to take interplanetary ver journeys. The type of vehicle you would have had to have a fast schedule development to follow space shuttle really would have been almost something like an American Soyuz vehicle. So if I had had the ability to have the resources available to make the exploration vehicle, I sure would have kept that gap to only two years. If I had really thought the resources wouldn't have been available and I went all the way back to 2006 or 2007, maybe in the interim I would have built a smaller vehicle so that right now, two years after the last space shuttle flight, it would be an American vehicle taking crew up to the space station and we'd be doing the exploration vehicle later. But that's just my opinion. Well, I had three conclusions from a planning and, and starting to implement the transition and retirement of the space shuttle. One was that you really have to know what your requirements are. You have to really know what work you need to do and how much of it is sufficient to get done to do your job. Now, that might sound like, like a really obvious project management thing, 
But in a really complex system or in a new endeavor, it can be really difficult to get your requirements set and get them agreed with all your stakeholders and your customers and not have those requirements creep and grow. But in planning out the transition retirement of the space shuttle, that was really critical. And it turned out it took us several years of iterations working with wider and wider groups to really nail down those requirements. The second point is that in, we found it was really important in such a, a complex task that affected so many different organizations that we had to communicate frequently about what we knew and what we didn't know, day to day, week to week, and month to month. Remember that what we're talking about here was the eventual shutdown and finish of the space shuttle program. This was something, working on the space shuttle was something people had spent their whole careers on. They got great job satisfaction of it. They were really carrying out a mission of great importance to the United States. And when it was successful, it was all coming to an end. Many of them didn't know where their next job would be. And of course, if you didn't know the exact date of when the last mission was going to be, you might not know when you were going to your next job. So it was really an emotional time. We found but John Olson and I, Bill Gerstenmeier, Scott Horowitz, uh, Tony Dawsey, everyone that was involved in this, Olga Dominguez, we found that if we didn't go out as the leadership and make people and brief people on what it is we knew, what we thought was going to happen, what decisions we thought were coming up, or even what we didn't know, that rumors and um, uncertainty would creep into everyone's um, activities and just cause um, a lot of disruption. So we found that even though something hadn't changed from week to week, we'd have to go out periodically and remind everyone that, that the last information we told them was still valid. Things hadn't changed, and they just had to proceed the way that they were working. Sometimes when there was a political changes or uncertainty, such as with the US election in 2008, people would ask us what we thought or if anything had changed. And sometimes we had to tell them um, that we don't know yet. And, and even telling them we didn't know yet sometimes put them at ease, because at least then they understood that information wasn't being withheld from them. The third point was something kind of unique to transition and retirement planning, I think, at NASA. NASA is a mission agency, and one of the things that was so difficult to plan for the TNR of the space shuttle was the disposition of so many types and so many quantities of things at the end of the program. For example, there were hundreds of federal facilities that needed to be dispositioned at the end of the space shuttle program. There was hundreds of thousands of line items of personal property that we had to find a home for. It either had to be transitioned to another NASA program or it had to be sold off. It had to go into museums. My personal view after having lived through the planning and part of the execution of the retirement of the space shuttle was that NASA is really good at, at engineering and development, really good at research, and really good at operations. But what NASA does not have much experience in is planning what I would call a quantity problem. That is, if you think about those 100,000 things that we had to disposition at the end of the space shuttle program, other than the big things like the space shuttle orbiters, where everyone wanted to know where those space shuttle orbiters were going to go at the end of the space shuttle program, you had to really figure out where you were going to send all the pieces of paper, where you're going to send all the computer disks, the wrenches, the chairs, the backup rocket engines, all the things that no one was going to need in the future. And you needed to have a way to do this so that you had a, not only had a good plan, but you had a way to judge whether you were executing the plan correctly. The analogy I used with John Olson was that it was almost like pouring um, um, chemical fluid or oil from one barrel to another. What you really were concerned about was how many drops came out and moved from one barrel to another. You didn't really care the order of the drops that came out. That's kind of a chemical engineering quantity problem in system engineering. Since NASA is usually focused on building one or two of a type of spacecraft, we're very focused on how to do a good job of building a new thing every time, but we really don't have much experience in doing the equivalent of a chemical engineering problem, a quantity problem. And in the future, when space station someday is retired, or, or in far future, decades from now, when Orion uh, and the, um, and the uh, space launch system are retired, someone is going to have to again face that quantity problem in its transition and its retirement. And probably by taking a page from the chemical process industry, NASA could do a faster job at doing that retirement planning in the future than we did the last time we did it for Space Shuttle. Being in the transition retirement manager was a job unlike any other that I had had. I, when I was uh, recruited by Mike Cause and Bill Gerstenmeier, I was leaving a position at Ames Research Center where I, was, where I was the director of project management and engineering at a NASA center. I was a program manager. I was an engineer. Uh, 
The reason I decided to take the job to be the transition manager was that it was so important to NASA and to the United States to do a good job at the transition, the constellation, and the eventual retirement of the space shuttle. I had, uh, in my prior career at NASA, I had helped put together missions of the space shuttle. I had gotten research results from the space shuttle. The space shuttle was not only a national asset, a useful thing, but it was a symbol of American strength and preeminence. And I really wanted to make sure that the planning and execution of the retirement and the transition of the space shuttle, not only let the space shuttle and the space station um, be successful, but successfully ramp into the follow-on human spaceflight program that will take Americans in the future to Mars, the asteroids, and other destinations. So even though the, the job itself of, say, being transition manager isn't really a project manager job at NASA, and it, and it almost sounds like an institutional job as opposed to a spacecraft development job, I thought it was a really important thing to do during those years to make sure that job was done right. Because I thought about it and I thought, if I don't take the position and the job gets done wrong, it's really going to affect NASA and the nation. So I pretty well went into it pretty enthusiastically. I also knew that if I was successful, the job had a definite end date. You know, if I was really successful, I'd end up getting all the work done really quick. I'd end up not spending a lot of money. And then I'd be going on looking for some other job to do at NASA, which eventually I did. But if I did, a, if I did the job well with the community, with John Olson, with Scott, with Gerst, with everyone that needed to be done, I would know that at least I allowed NASA to make the fast, best progress it could to successfully complete shuttle and station and fly out into the next human spaceflight program. And I'd be proud of that and happy I was able to do that.